We'd like to start out by thanking our valuable sponsors. Sense of Satisfaction by Cricut is the place for all your fragrance needs. Plus, she's got products to heal what ails your skin and your hair. Shop at sensebycricket.com. Special thanks to our valued sponsor, John Travis, a financial coach and certified kingdom advisor with Richard Young Associates, a registered investment advisor. Thanks goes to Anna Patterson, my sister in the Lord who faithfully gives to this ministry every month. And to our newest sponsor, LaToya Gerard of Preach the Word Worldwide Network. She is a valued sponsor and a major encourager regarding this ministry. We need and would love to have you as a sponsor. Absolutely no gift is too small. Please note the info regarding giving throughout and at the end of the show and help us spread these testimonies around the world. Please note that the views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily the viewpoints of our sponsor. It's time to hear the story, make the connection, learn the lesson, and gain the wisdom. Are you ready? Let's get charged and be changed. The Sister Speak Brother Break Show. Conversations on grace, healing, and deliverance. This is Marcy Bush. Come on, let's journey together. She got smart after my son was born in the second year. I figured out and devised a plan. I guess you could kind of say I was one step ahead um, and devised a plan. And I moved us back to um, the Virginia area. Okay. The only reason I did that was because it was closer to my family. I had a great level of concern of being so far away and things being so off. Okay. And not having any support at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say probably after my third child was born is when, excuse me. Yes. After my third child was born, some of the physical aggression started. Um, and now before um, you take us there, how were you able to get him to move? Um, I had to learn how to be manipulative because he has a narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So I think my level of intelligence and just the help of the Holy Ghost, I became very smart and tried to like outsmart his game. Okay. One of the things that narcissistic individuals do is they walk you around in a circle so they never really answer your question. Uh -huh. For example, um, I could say, do you want to go to the store? And he'll be like, I don't know. Do you want to go to the store? I mean, come on. It's a simple yes or no, right? right. Um, and so it was never that easy. And so I really just kind of had to get good at the game, if you want to say. Okay. And I figured out and devised a plan. It was like, look, we really need to move back. You know, it's not really working out well here for us because financially we were not doing well. Um, mm -hmm. That was another way that he actually took advantage of things. And so I was like, look, you know, it's not working here. Let's try something else. Let's, you know, move back closer to my family, your family, you know, hopefully things will be better. And so I just, I became very smart and, figured out how am I going to manipulate mentally? Um, and that's a shame because you shouldn't have to do that over somebody else. You should be able to work together, especially if you're in a relationship or a partnership to um, provide. And there are children involved now. So, you know, you have to realize not only are we being affected, but these small children are being affected as well. Right. So. And I don't know. I just... When you say, and it's just me, but when I hear you say you had to learn to manipulate, for some reason I'm like, but that wasn't manipulation in a way. It almost feels like a tactical maneuver. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you had to, in order to survive, I guess when I think about manipulation, I think it, I, I really think about it from a negative sense. I would feel like that's what he was doing to you, but I right. felt like yours, it was almost a self-defense move. You know, it, you had to have, you had to create some tactics. And like you said, with the Holy Spirit's help to show you how to maneuver around this thing and to give you insight into what you needed to do to be able to get, you know, ahead, to be able to, to pull, uh, you know, to be able to maneuver that thing some, so. 
that's and that's just me. I don't want it if I don't want it to seem like okay, he's manipulating and I'm manipulating. And you were trying to survive. I was. I was trying to make things better because things were not good, especially once our son was born. He really wanted boys, and uh, he just totally devoted everything uh, to his son um, and his daughter. And if I wasn't removed before, I was really removed, and I honestly just felt like the maid, the babysitter, the you know the caretaker. I was no longer a wife. Okay. Okay. And that in and of itself is a form of mental abuse. I feel like that's mental abuse. You talked about the the finances um, coming into play too. And I know when I um, saw you typing before in, in Artisha's, um, in her setting, when she did something during Domestic um, Violence Month and you were her guest, um, and then the, the, um, what do we call it? All the stuff with technology <laughs> got in the way that time too. And you weren't able to appear on there, but you were typing. Um, and, uh, you talked then about financial abuse. And I guess that's an aspect that I had never really thought about. I, I'd never heard it given that name. What does that look like? Well, I'm not sure if that's an actual term or a correct term. The reason why I believe I use it is because he had total control of the finances. So mm -hmm. I literally had no control um, as far as money. I would make money. I would work, uh, things like that. But basically he get the, he, excuse me, he was able to make all the decisions when it came down to the finances and how the money was spent. Okay. Um, once we moved back to this area, of course, being more of an expensive area, um, the situation even became more difficult. And even when I worked, I was still required to pay for like the daycare or things of that nature. Nothing came out of his check. Mm -hmm. So there were times when I was standing in a food line or doing different things that okay. I should not have been doing because he was holding all the money and was not sharing that money with me. So that's considered a form of control or financial abuse from my understanding at this point in time. Okay. What was the time, what was the first time that the physical abuse occurred? Uh, probably around 2008, 2009. This was after my fourth child was born. So, uh, so it did not progress for that long? I mean, in, in that aspect, as far as a physical I'm surprised right. that I think for a lot of people it happens earlier on because you said you got married in 2000. Yeah, correct. Wow. And so mm -hmm. that didn't surface until way later. Yes. A uh, couple things is that one, we moved around a lot um, just because he was in charge of finances and stuff and finances were not taken care of properly. Uh, we did move around a lot once we moved back to the area and, um, Basically, he was working full time and there were issues with our children as far as mental illness and um, emotional illness and um, medical illness. And um, I don't think one person can fully take care of that on their own. And he was working two jobs. And so I think that when the children started to become older, because at that time, my oldest would have been like eight or nine um, and she was like running out the house. <laughs> while my husband was not there. Um, and here I am with my other children running behind her, mm -hmm. trying to go get her. Um, and there were not interventions in place at the time because my ex-husband didn't think that there was anything wrong or anything going on with the children. He okay. thought it was actually me that I was not able to parent my children properly. Okay. And so because of that, that's when the physical violence actually started more so because he became so angry, he couldn't control his temper. Mm. Okay. So on top of, and, and I guess it will be a show for another time, but just to give that context, on top of everything that you were enduring with your husband, then you were having to try to figure out how to manage with children who were dealing with mental illness, emotional illness, and physical illness. 
So you had a lot going on. And by this time you did have all four of your children. I did. My youngest was two at this time when the violence, the physical violence started. Okay. And so um, what was the first act that you remember? Well, they call it the Vulcan group. I don't know if that's the correct terminology, but basically he would actually put his hands around my neck um, in his frustration and his anger and would just squeeze. And I just prayed to God that he would release. Um, and that's how he did it most of the time. So there were no physical marks. There was no information, excuse me, or um, evidence to show that there was actually domestic violence actually occurring. Um, fortunately, I had a, we had CPS and we had um, the police involved in 2010. And I think that's kind of what brought things to head that actually things were going on in the home that shouldn't be going on. Okay. And so were your children present when he, when he would grab you around the neck? Were they in there? Uh, I believe my oldest was present um, because that's normally the one we were quarreling over. Um, and he was upset about, and she was the one who was having issues. Um, so I believe the oldest one was there. It's been a while. i kind of moved on from some memory. Um, but I believe she was present at the time. Um, at the very last time, probably on the fifth or sixth time when he did it, we were actually in a hotel and all four children were present. Okay. And then the very last time when I did a death drop, um, he... Um, Tell me what that means. Basically, he um, pushed me so hard that I fell backwards, flat on my back, and I had to go pick up my um, children right after school. So I was in a lot of pain because I, I fell right back flat on the carpet. So. And what did it look like? Um, did it get worse when you tried to leave or did it did so there were never any any marks that anyone could see that no. you could report so there were no black eyes there were no busted lips none of that stuff was occurring no unfortunately not and um the only thing that really saved me was two things we actually had cps involved and um so there were now, and for those who don't know what CPS. Oh, sorry. It's um child protective services. Mm -hmm. And with that being in place, um, that kind of helped me along the way. Um, there was a time when they were actually thinking about taking all of our children away and putting them in foster care, which I was not aware of um, until we actually got to the meeting. And so um the um what precipitated CPS being involved? Uh, actually at one point, my daughter, um, my, my ex-husband actually supposedly quote unquote hung my daughter from her neck, um, in the kitchen. I was present in the house. I heard her screaming, but I did not see actually what was going on. So I don't know the full facts, but because I was present, I was, um, just as in much trouble as he was, if you want to put it that way. So my daughter came to me and said, mom, what should I do? Me being a mom, what should have I done? I should have said, you need to tell somebody. We need to call somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but I left it up to her. I said, you need to do what you feel you need to do. Okay. And um, the other thing was that I was just trying to keep our family intact. I was trying to keep us alive. And so what I guess what I want to say to people is it's hard to protect your child when you're just trying to protect yourself and protect your children at the same time. So I didn't even have enough where all to be able to help my daughter to do the right thing. And uh, she went to a school counselor. And uh, the next thing I knew it, we had the sheriff knocking on the door and stuff. Okay. Now tell me, how does it feel as a mother to know that this is not what you like, know this is not what you wish for your children, but uh, did it just leave you feeling helpless? Did you not feel like I need to take them at that point? I need to take them and go. Did you tell me what was kind of in your thoughts at that time when you began to see the abuse with your children? 
I think my commitment to God was so much that there's a lot of times when we as women, we say we're going to get married and we're going to stay married. Okay. And um, I didn't believe in divorce. Okay. Excuse me. And we agreed that there wouldn't be divorce. So okay. for me, it was like um, just really determined to do everything so that we didn't have a divorce. Yeah. Um, so that was always in the back of my mind. So I was always trying to figure out like, how can I make things work? Like what tactic is, if you want to say like earlier, what tactic can I figure out to maybe make things better or to change things? Mm -hmm. um, but then to, um, I don't think that I ever like thought whole picture because I couldn't think whole picture. I had to think like right in the moment and it was like moment by moment. Okay. Um, and when he was gone is when I had more relief. But then if anything happened or if something out of the ordinary happened, it was coming back to me. So there was never really an opportunity to stop and think right. until I really decided that enough was enough. Right. Okay. So and I don't think that I, oh, sorry, I don't think I could have even really protected my children because like hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. When I go back to it, I could barely even protect myself. Yes. So, yes. you know, my whole goal was to make sure that my children and I stayed alive. Right. And I think too, like we said, when from the beginning, when you're getting the that verbal abu abuse, that emotional abuse, it takes a toll on your thought pattern. It takes a toll on your thought life. And and a lot of times you do feel like, okay, well, this is my fault. And I've I've heard other people who, like you said, do not want to break up the family. They feel like my children need a father. And us having a two-parent home is going to be best. And so um, especially the way a lot of us were taught um, in Christian homes too, you know, like you said, you don't, and, and our, with a, along with your own personal convictions, it's like you don't want to um, betray this this promise that you've made to God about you being one with this person and remaining married until death does your part, you know? Um, so I think it just takes a lot of prayer and hearing God for yourself, you know, for any women who may be out there um, watching this, listening to this right now, you know, um, yes, the Bible is there, but sometimes we have to get really, well, not sometimes, we have to have a relationship with God and we have to hear the Holy Spirit. You know, I've heard my pastor talk about the proceeding word. And it's kind of like with um, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was going to be in complete obedience. And if he had not heard <laughs> Abraham stay your hand, that was the proceeding word. That was the next word. And so when you hear that next word, a lot of times we begin to question ourselves about, did we really hear before? <laughs> You know, so what am I supposed to do? But if you actually make, you know, that get that prayer life, have that time with God, then he begins to confirm. He begins to give that wisdom, said it was that understanding, that death drop. It, was it after that when you said, OK, I got to go? It was because I'd actually lived in a shelter for about. Uh, four or five months and he convinced me to come back saying things would be different uh, we lived there probably for about a year or two and then that's actually when the abuse started again as far as physically um, and after that I had just had enough and I had prayed and I was like Lord I need help I need to figure out how to get out of this rat race I literally had an index card that had every movement that I made from like the time I got up to the time I went to bed and um, how to take care of the four children and take care of him and like all the responsibilities of a mother and a working person. I mean, just, it was ridiculous. It was like I was a hamster in a, um, you know, in a wheel that just constantly went around and around and around and it was never stopping. And I had prayed and there's uh, um, 
organization within our church at the time called the Stevens Ministry. And normally they take about six months or so to match you with a mentor. And I was literally matched within two weeks. Mm-hmm. And that was like the blessing in disguise. And she literally met me uh, every week. And normally they meet like every other week or, you know, they don't really invest a lot of time. They're there to kind of help guide you, mm-hmm. um, but not necessarily like devote as much as she did. And they normally stay for about six months. And she actually stayed for three years because she saw the progression that was slowly taking place. And um, it took about a year. Um, and we just slowly took step by step, you know, one thing at a time. It wasn't going to just happen overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, right. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff occurred over several years. And so slowly but surely, she just held my hand and we took one step at a time. Um, and uh, it was a, about a year after that I had gotten my own place. I was approved. I was supposed to move in seven days. I had no money. I didn't have a deposit. I had absolutely nothing. And I was like, I had signed the lease. And I said, Lord, how am I going to do this Mm -hmm. with four kids, no furniture, nothing? And uh, within five days, I had my money got provided and we moved into our own place. Thank you. And I've been in my own place since then. Okay. How would you suggest if, if there were someone at church and you sense that something is off what do you think might be a good way to approach that person I think really building a friendship with somebody first of all getting to know them having the opportunity to just invite them for dinner or something of that nature really um, getting somebody to trust you you know because that's one of the things that we lose very quickly Mm-hmm. Um, because we're told that we shouldn't trust anybody, that people are not okay, people are out to hurt you. It could just be the most minute thing. Mm-hmm. So I think building that relationship is extremely important because we're not going to just open up right to you. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, people could just say the right thing and we could burst because we're to that point. But mm-hmm. that happening is more likely than not to happen. Gotcha. So building that relationship um, and just being there Sometimes, whether to be on the phone or whatever, you'll find out more information with that relationship, you know, and that kind of goes back to God because, you know, he talks to us about having that personal relationship with him, yes. you know, and um, that's where we build our trust because we don't trust easily. And once you've been burnt, you know, anybody in society, they struggle to trust somebody else or it takes them a while. So yes. by building that relationship and that friendship and saying it's okay. Uh, and it takes time. It's not going to happen just overnight. But really um, knowing that you're there for them to support them makes a huge difference. What was it like for you to leave? What did that look like? How did that maneuver go? Uh, so I moved probably two or three miles away. Um, and I actually moved into my own apartment. We had nothing. Um, we literally slept on cots. Um, my um son slept on the floor my two daughters shared a cot and my other daughter and myself shared a cot like a Coleman cot and um I kept promising my kids that in April when I got my taxes back we would go get furniture so we went to Ikea one time and we all picked out furniture and so two months later two or three months later we finally had furniture in our house and it was like a big accomplishment I can't even begin to tell you like how thrilled I was that my children finally had their own beds. They, they were able to pick things out. They were in a safe, comfortable environment. Um, you know, there was an opportunity where they could actually start to thrive because when you're fighting for your life every day, that really messes up your hierarchy. Yes. And I noticed today sometimes that so, some of us, or even myself, we remain in um, fight or flight. And unfortunately, it is because of the issues that we actually went through. Um, And so one thing is that um, even though we left, um, sometimes I wonder if we still left because there's still our triggers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now did he know that you were leaving? He didn't know until almost the very last moment. And then after I left in February, we moved in our own place. Um, I think it was February 15th. So every year we celebrate February 15th. It's kind of a thing we do as a family. And, um, Two months later, he moved literally across the street from me. Across the street? 
across the street. His reasoning was so that our children could go back and forth so that he could, so that our children could have the best of both of us. But we all know that's not true. Right. It was more out of control and trying to keep an eye on me. Yes. So, I mean, even though I tried to leave, it was crazy. And we have been through the court system between child support, divorce, everything else. Probably in four or five years, I was in the system like 60 times going mm. back and forth to court. So he was trying to just exhaust me financially to right. um, regain his children back. Wow. And so he, he was trying to get custody of the children. Yes. And so he would. One of the things in our court agreement is that we were not supposed to speak ill of our children and in front of the presence of our children about either parent. Um, I have a very high regard for the law and I don't mess with that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there were times when he did. Um, it got to the point where we actually had to have um, conference calls and they had to be recorded by law because he was just damaging me and who I was as an individual and telling the children incorrect information. Okay. So it, even though, if you want to say I left, I left, but it didn't leave. Right. The abuse continued. You were just not in the home with right. him. And so it even sounds like stalking, in a sense, um, just still almost like this shadow. I just never knew when he might show up. <laughs> so, um, but did know. you have the right? The courts never said I, that. He I could actually put a restraining. Oh, sorry, I put a restraining order in the very beginning when I went to the shelter the very first time when I left. Um, but later on, I did not put a restraining order back in effect because I felt that I was okay. My two closest friends were very concerned for my safety and my children's safety. Um, along the way, um, he did have rights, but slowly because he chose not to follow court orders, he slowly lost, uh, we, we use the word control, or opportunities to be with his children and do certain things with his children. And they've just gotten more and more restricted. Um, wow. Unfortunately, he's not able to see his children now. And Thanks so much for joining us today. If you've been blessed by today's show, feel free to let us know. And if you'd like to sow into this ministry, become a sponsor or contact us. You can reach us at 803-221-0169. Or you can email us at the SSBB show at gmail.com. Let's continue this journey together.